Okay, hi everyone, welcome to another episode of From the Bottom Up. And I'm grateful to have David here with me. Mm, great to be here. I really wanted to take this week to go into some deep topics that might be able to be used. Yeah, I guess I just have to start out uh, <laughs> just with whatever I'm feeling right now, which is what we have to do from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. I was talking with Helena, she said, uh, Helena, Elias, she said she likes the show because she's tired of putting pressure on herself to, to be at the top, but she just looks at what is being presented every day. Mm -hmm. It's easier, and the thing is, I don't really have like a super specific, we might get into one, but it, it seems like it's just fear, and I haven't gone this, this long of a time, like, since actually since you were <laughs> arrived, whatever that means, that um, I've just felt fear, and it goes away, and actually even today, I noticed how easy it was that that fear turned into like, whoa, how simple and lovely or loving or gentle, almost like a crown chakra opening up and just, and then one thought, and it would like turn into what I felt as fear. It was like, almost like this in the mind. And I know metaphysically that that may be a sign of getting closer to the love because when you're, that's good instead of, like what happened this morning was I, after I got up from that experience of doing the lesson, listening to your reading, and then I went to pick a tea. And the first tea that went through my mind was chai. And I thought, oh, chai tea. Oh, great, that'll help me if I go for a walk because it'll give me, it'll wake me up. And I thought, oh, wow, that's some false cause and effect. Now I'll have this other one, licorice or whatever, because that will that will calm me and I'm, I'm on the edge with the fear. I thought, whoa, that's false cause and effect, mm -hmm. and, and it seemed actually distant from that experience of like this in the mind where both of them were, were fragments of the fear, both of them were keeping me in a body identity, and so with prayer I just, I chose a berry tea, which was mm -hmm. neither of them. Mm -hmm. It might sound silly, but, but that has been the experience, and what happened on the online retreat with you um, that morning I'd had some of those, what I don't know if you remember what I called stupid thoughts that just come up, and mm -hmm. they really don't go anywhere when I share them, and you had given me permission to say them. But I was going to experiment with a deeper lesson, and on the retreat, I was watching the movie, and I had this experience, I shared this with you a bit, that some kind of a past memory came up where, like, I used to be on the rugby team, and on the rugby team, if I um, didn't do it well enough, like a, a run through all the guys, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that, the coach would be like, you're doing it again. But, okay. So, you know, everybody would finish, and then it'd be my turn. I'd do it again. He would forget, and I'd say, coach, coach, i got to do it again. And every, I got the nickname Honest J mm -hmm. on the team. And I have another of instances like that, and they all flashed through my mind that, okay, you've got to tell what it is you're thinking or, or be very consistent with what you're doing. And, but it all flashed through in a different way, like maybe it was all a defense and maybe I, I actually am hiding thoughts that I have that I won't even let into awareness because I know I'm going to have to say them or speak them. So mm -hmm. the very idea of like no private thoughts has been twisted and I felt some kind of a relief. So I've been experimenting with not just saying everything, but then the fear is just even more intense. So that's the first thing I wanted to go into, see if you have anything when I say that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's... You're aware of how clever the ego is, so even when we look at something like no private thoughts, no people pleasing, the value of disclosing, the value of transparency, that uh, the ego can twist it a little bit to give more value to speaking them up um, more in a, in a ritualistic way. Um, it's almost like it's a way that the ego, you know, sometimes will have us convoke converse things around just f to avoid um, being intuitive because there's fear around being intuitive with it and so it's almost like the old thing of you know don't hit me I'll hit myself first um, you know don't blame me for not 
expressing these thoughts or, or hiding these thoughts or repressing these thoughts and then it kind of swings the other way where we used to joke like with the spiritual Tourette's we would call it where you have had relationships where you just speak up every thought unfiltered and uncensored and so your wife or your partner would, would just go, whoa, this takes a lot of getting used to. This is like un, unlike any relationship I've ever had that the reactions come so strong. But ultimately, you know, it, it is a fear of, of guidance. It's a fear of, of the Holy Spirit. And as we take it even deeper that, it's, it's the, the fear of God's will, which it, it sounds funny to people. Why be afraid of God's will? Especially when you, you learn that God's will for you is perfect happiness, then that really seems strange. Why be afraid of perfect happiness? And it's because the mind is so associated with the ego and this world that now perfection or perfect love is, is now fearful. So Jesus tells us in the Course, one of the strangest beliefs that the human mind has invented is the fear of God's will. And so that's what we're dealing with when we have this kind of fear popping up and, and coming to the surface. It really, it's only been the ego's tricks that have told us it's about things in the world. As if there's causes in the world for the fear and there's corrections for the world, in the world, that for that fear when really neither are true. So there's a whole bunch of false, spurious cause-effect relationships in the sleeping mind that have to be raised to the light, uh, little by little, by the Holy Spirit. And that's where the, the fear is coming up, because it's the fear, it seems like the fear of the destruction of your own thought system. It seems like loss of self, and that's terrifying. So it's still one step away from the fear of of God's will, but that's the way it seems to the world, like the world is like the, the environment that the mind, the sleeping mind is now accustomed to and it's afraid to give it up. It's afraid to let it go. It doesn't know what, what will come in this unknown of letting go of the familiar and you know that's what's happening deeper in the mind all the time. So why, if it's letting go of the familiar, it doesn't seem to have too much of a specific right now. It's more like just very, and so then, yeah, I guess the, the deeper question is how do I go through that? Because is it just more of like a time to just sit with it and give the space to allow that, which is what I've been telling people on some counseling calls that I've been having which is very new for me to have because like this one lady I was talking with and it was so tempting for me to say, well, there's a function there waiting for you to follow. If you'll just put the prayer out and it'll come and you can listen. And I have that experience when I have joinings here or even when I'm on that counseling call. It's like it, it disappears from awareness and you can't, you cannot negate the power of, of just doing what it is the Holy Spirit would have you, living mm -hmm. under Christ's control, right? Mm -hmm. But... I don't also want that to come from a panic, like, oh, I've got fear, like, okay, what am I going to do to just do something? And, and I feel like a lot of, maybe even the last months, it was just getting to that point where there was so much to do, and it was just covering over this. And so, yeah, is it okay to sit with it? And how, yeah, how do you know, what do, how do you know when you're supposed to take something on or just sit with it? Yeah, well, I think the way the self-concept is constructed, that it seems different for everybody, and so everybody has different pressure points, everybody has different uh, jugulars, so to speak, as you start to, to come towards this fear. And for some, it's about controlling the environment, for some it's about um, controlling the body, um, for some it's about controlling relationships. Uh, but basically, there's an authority issue underneath and, and there is going to be fear with trying to make up and hold on to an identity that God didn't create. And so it takes different variations and so that's why um, 
this allowance of this permission, maybe you have a counseling call where you just show up and you're just truly there to be helpful, you're wide open, you feel very still, very non-judgmental, and the, if there's any support, nurturing, guidance, just pours through very easily. And then in other areas where the self-concept is kind of tight, then there's a, you know, a, a sense of needing to move through it, but that takes a lot of allowance, a lot of trust, a lot of faith. Uh, it's interesting that um, I had a call this morning with your, your ex-wife and we were on the phone and she's going through an issue that now is coming around again with, with Clint and it was there for you where you had such um, difficulty with relationships, dating or romantic relationships in your life, and then when you got to a point of marriage, there, it's still, there was a lot of um, fear around relationships, and, and, and you were asking for permission, and I need to explore, I need to discover, and for her, it was just at the time, just reaching a point where that was just too far, like she couldn't go there as much as she would like to, it was too threatening. She had a concept of a marriage, a concept of a relationship that you were starting oh, to, oh, right, right, to bounce, right, right. Uh, where, where you're saying, listen, I'm, maybe you had relationships before, but I, I haven't, and I, there's some things I need to face and explore, and I can't feel a sense of rigidity with it, and I need to have an openness to it. And, uh, and similarly then, Clint coming around and raised Mormon and many rules around relationships and feeling boxed in, very tight, um, needing to explore. But also, here it comes around again, wow. and this time seeing it, she's seeing it like, oh, it's about me being in that depth of trust, that depth of, of openness, that depth of open-mindedness, so mm -hmm. that I can be fully present and be there and be used and let this relationship be used where, as before, maybe the fear was too mm -hmm. too great to offer that uh, permissiveness and, and spaciousness that was required. Here it is coming around again and seeing, oh, that's my, my opportunity. Uh, and, and really that's how it goes for everyone. Some people do it around food, some people do it around environments or the way controlling their body and body size and shape and or maybe at work, you know, getting into kind of issues with coworkers or with the boss or whatever. But in the end, to be under Christ control, <coughs> it takes a lot of faith, <coughs> a lot of trust to really go all the way with it. And as we know from the manual for teachers, it starts off with trust. That's the basic mm -hmm. That's the basis of all the characteristics of God's teachers. And then the very last one to come in is open-mindedness, which the trust level has grown so strong that then you're ready to go for this complete non-judgment, complete acceptance. <coughs> so there can be glimmers of like these abstract mystical experiences. That's like showing you a glimpse of, of where it's going, but the actual consistency comes into allowing yourself that permission to face what you have to face and be shown uh, mm. experientially that, that there's nothing to fear, Lesson 48. Mm. So um, it can come up sometimes, it's very specific when it comes up and sometimes it's very non-specific. And it can even be a little more frightening because the mind starts thinking, why am I so afraid? What, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Where's the intensity coming from? And when there doesn't seem to be anything in my my perception that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. where there would that would correspond with that mm -hmm. level of fear. So it's like unspecific fear just coming up. And I think again, that's going deeper, and it's just Jesus inside saying, "Just trust me. I'm with you. I'll take you through this. I'll carry you through this." Uh, just stay with me, just we'll go through this step by step. It's a very intricate process and, and it's like you have to really be navigated and guided through it moment by moment, day by day, but um, it's not something that you can figure out on the surface. So if I've never felt this fear like this before, is it I've just been 
covering it over, or it's now just time? Yeah. It's time. time. Like there's, there's a readiness, there's a willingness to let it come into awareness. Okay, well, so this, this goes into the next thing then, actually. Um, in some ways, I feel like, like I had a call with um, Deanna the other day, and well, two calls, both of them, they were just, I didn't expect it actually, but we were, by the end, we were just very, very connected. It was just very beautiful, and the fear was gone, and it was like part of the connecting with her was the direction for something a specific, mm -hmm. um, which I don't really need to go into, but to arise and, um, and move through, through the connection. But I never would have guessed that mm -hmm. that was it. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice. But, oh, yeah. So I was, well, I was feeling like today the Spirit would show me what specifically He would want me to look at. And what happened was, is we got, I got a call. I got a call right before this shooting, before lunch actually. And um, it was two people that, uh, we're coming down to live in our community, and they don't like the conditions that they're met with at the property. And, and I felt on the call, my first call with them, like I was just trying to feel what it is I feel. And there was a point where I could just feel like there's no openness. There's no openness to go into anything. And if I started it, like the connection was bad or it got blocked, but there was also some kind of understanding about what it is they were saying. Like they were saying these words like, we can't live with this and all these, well, yeah, nobody in the world, everyone, anyone in the world would say that to me normally, except mm -hmm. people in our community. Like that's a common statement that they would mm -hmm. say. I don't know if I really want to go into the specifics. I'm just trying to, and so it's like, I understand that, right? I understand it. And when I understand it, I felt, well, how can I go against that? So that's false empathy to me because I'd already joined with you and I got a context that was basically, to, you know, to deliver more clarity than just listening to something that I understand from the world. Mm. But that's, as far as we could go, the spirit ended the call because of the connection and everything. So I went in, I gave the report to you and a couple others that were in the room. And uh, we even called Emily in from Spain and, and Deanna was on the call. and. And the way you guys were talking is like you were so sure about, you're so sure about something, like so much deeper, like you don't, see, you're not seeing through a filter of any belief that there's a worldly cause at all. And I was willing to explore it even to try to like, okay, how do we keep, keep them there basically? <laughs> so I'm getting to a point. So I left the room and I talked to Emily about what she wanted to join about and asked her some questions and she gave me some context to fill me in that I didn't even know about because I have less context than I have had in a long time mm -hmm. about things. And she gave me context and I was just like, wow, wow, wow. And it sunk in what you guys were saying even deeper. And that's how we've always been. You've always been so generous with context and with everybody. Mm -hmm. And I feel maybe even especially me because I need it a lot. So I get all this context and my mind relaxes and then I can go deliver it. But this is like 10 or 15 years where I get this context and I deliver. And even I was reaching a point when I was overseeing aspects of the ministry or more of the ministry where I would, didn't even necessarily feel what was being given to me to say, but I'd say it. And then all this emotion would come up because I couldn't believe I was saying it. I felt better and good. And, but it never comes out like you guys where at least how it comes to me. Because I know when you meet with the actual people that it's very different. There's like a, an art and sometimes it will come through. But when it's with me, it's like, da -da -da. <laughs> this is my perception. <laughs> da -da -da -da. <laughs> and, da -da -da -da. and I try to get on these calls and deliver like that. And it, it is so hard and it's so intense and I can't. And I, I almost feel like I fail all these missions. Because it's so hard to get to that space. And I'm always trying to practice being firm that way. But... But when I hear the context from Emily and I'm like, oh yeah, now I can go deliver it and wait till it comes out that way. And I guess my point is I feel like I'm failing and I'm, I think the Spirit wants me to talk right now about this because if this is a major thing I'm going to see, the only thing I can understand is it's some deep protectionism 
But when I was listening to Emily and meditating with her, it like, it got me through it. But I can't get through this. This is like a long time. I'm not, if, if this is truly false empathy, is this even for me? Like, what is going on? I can't live like this anymore. So. Yeah. I think there's different phases too. Like, you've, you've been used in those kind of contexts where it was almost like Spirit saying, here, I want you to put your mind into this and it's going to be a lot and it's going to be used to, for your mind training, you know, to just hold on to a big, broad context. You've done this with construction sites, with right. starting off with new people, with unwinding people that are tied in, you know, working with a, a judge who's been at Harvard <laughs> and did some stripping and, I mean, all kinds of wild things. I know that one. <laughs> You maybe <laughs> didn't even know all the context of things, but you've been used by the Spirit to, to uh, kind of be loaded up and, and then it's like, Spirit's like, here, now I want you to listen and follow and, and use it with this bigger context. And then there are other times when uh, the, the lesson is also a listen and follow, but it's not like a loading up the mind with it. It's not like that assignment where you're given so much, like a, a huge download and have to be aware of all these things and have to be discerning and, you know, uh, like uh, in the movie Next, you know, the main character is, you know, he seems to be able to see into the future and, to, was it two minutes into yeah. the future? And he, that mechanism is used for him to start to develop his trust and and undo his own rebellions and fears and issues and authority issues and everything. And so you can just think of that as that's a phase and then there's other phases where the Spirit is saying like, well, we're going to move through some really dark stuff that's been repressed for a while and you're going to need your energy really and your focus to move through this. Almost like a, in a hermitage experience, you know, you don't have a lot going on. Usually for most people they take a very simple time away in a cabin mm -hmm. or off, off away to, to move through a lot of dark emotions. So I don't think you should take that personally in the sense that if you're in a kind of a context where in some ways you've been guided to kind of step back from holding on to these big contexts all the time. And then even this request that comes in, a call to you for some help, if you put your mind into it, then it does, you can, of course it's good to have more of the con context, context, but you need you like your cliff notes, you know, in front of you, like, oh, oh, okay, 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 then I'm clear, I can accept this mini little assignment with these notes all laid out in front of me. But that's not generally where your mind's at in the way mm -hmm. your mind is at right now. It's been more of a, of a stepping back from having a huge context of things. Not that anything's going wrong, but it's just that that's part of it and that you're moving through some some deeper, darker things and you just need your attention and focus for that. So I always felt at the beginning years when I was traveling around the country driving, I'd have all these emotions coming up, huge intense emotions, but there'd be driving on the road with playing my little cassette tapes and praying and sometimes for many hours before the next destination and then going through so much intensity I'm thinking I cannot, I don't know how I'm going to have holy encounters or even speak at the next destination with it because my mind is so intense. But sure enough, eight hours later, ten hours later, twelve hours later, oh, I feel great, okay, I have time to speak and it would come through me and this went on and on. It was like a flushing permission to go deep, move through dark things, and then times where it was just like being under Christ's control, where I was calmed, clear, let the things up and out, and then I would get used. And I would think, wow, that was miraculous, that was amazing. Back on the road, more stuff, <laughs> intense stuff to come go through. It just was like, that was like the method that it would go over and over. So yeah, there's a lot of, realistically, a lot of clearing to happen, and we have to really trust that we're given space, we're given quiet space when we need it, we're given rest space when we need it. There's nothing going wrong, there's nothing to analyze or figure out about it. Just appreciation and gratitude 
you know, that there is one in charge within that, that knows the way and is watching over us and caring for us in, in such a, a devoted way and then and leading the way. But it mm. takes it off of trying to figure it out or compare or contrast with anybody else. Mm. Yeah, it is that comparing and that contrasting really. But isn't there a deeper lesson that somehow that like like my first, my default answer is someone expects you, if you hadn't given me that context, my default response would be someone's abused. And because my, because this is 95% of my time is in the community, it plays out within the people in the community, right? So it's, it's not like, it, oh, I can go out there, but why well, can't? So if there's this default, like, how did they get, okay, well then how do we solve that instead of like instantly seeing it as a, f you know, forgiveness opportunity. My function, my only function is the one God gave me. If there's this, and then, okay, the context helped me to see, oh yeah, wow, that definitely is a forgiveness opportunity. Boy, I was wrong to see that right off the bat. And, but this, I don't know, something I still want. I want a mechanism to go through that like in a deeper way because... Maybe that's what's generating this fear on a deeper level, but I can't do it with just showing up in a talk and trying to be firm and like you're, you're giving me the space that maybe that's not even what I'm supposed to be doing right now, mm -hmm. but I'm just so afraid of going backwards in this time where I'm off <laughs> that I'll, you know, go weak, get kicked out or something. <laughs> Well, it's even with that, you know, it's like we have so many encounters and, and every single holy encounter is just to offer a blessing. And so that's the value for me of always. I loved to travel because I knew that, that Jesus was behind me and he just wanted me to offer a blessing all the time. And so I got into that mode and I was just very prayerful, not having any kind of agenda of what to say or do. He would kind of sometimes give me a little heads up, like go to a rest area or uh, to a hostel or someplace and he would say, see that one over there? You're going to have an encounter with her tomorrow at the, for breakfast. And I'm like, really? I go to bed, wake up, be in there fixing breakfast, there she comes, on cue, <laughs> Jesus, thank you for the heads up there, that's nice. At the very beginning, it gives you a little... You need that. Yeah, little crumbs and uh, so you're not too thrown off and, yeah. and you're pre prepared in some sense and and so that that was helpful that was helpful then I find that the spiritual journey goes so deep that that um, we're never really trying to change somebody's mind or perception uh, but but there are those when the ones called themselves students are showing up David I'm you're my teacher I'm your student and this and this and I was like Jesus, is this how it goes? He's like, yep. And then even among the students, I would wait for them to come to me and, and say, you know, I'm here for, to work with you, I love you, I trust you. If you see anything in my mind or anything that's going on, I give you permission to point yeah. that out and bring that up. And I wait patiently yeah. for the Invite. invitation and then follow the invitation you know, but m the majority of the encounters were just blessing. The more the majority, you meet somebody on the road or in the rest area or as you're out and about, and they're not walking up to you and saying, I give you full invitation to point out anything you see. That's very rare, but there are those that do do that, and when they, when they do do that, then there's the invitation there. So it's not like uh, so much that that you have to go in and convince somebody of something, but you can't lose sight of the fact that, that it's all for you, it's all for your lesson, and that it's all about healing, healing in mind. And for some, uh, they may say, thank you, wow, that's, that's amazing, I, that's right, that's, what's, that's why I'm here, that's what it's for. And for others they may say, no, that that's not at all what what I want. So if I can, because I 
felt like I've been intuitive and I can feel that they're not open and yet I almost feel like I have this assignment to be clear. Is that fighting against the intuition or is it I'm, you know, there's a false empathy filter and I need to like, yeah, I probably blew my question apart, but there's something in there like, do I have to wait till I feel the invite all the time or because this, yeah. Well, I just, I always love the invites and also I'm, I'm really big on shared agreements. So I love Ooh. that, Ooh. that things are offered and opened up and when something's offered, right. it can be accepted or right. refused. So there's no co coercion, there's no twisting of arms and everything. In fact, as we move through time and space and we go through our days, we have a bunch of things. You go out and you fill your, your car up with gas, little digital thing. Now it's, you know, you just, you don't even have to go inside and pay. And the little digital thing says, would you like a receipt? There's the question. There's your shared agreement. <laughs> There's a shared agreement. You push yes, a little, a little receipt comes out. Sometimes <laughs> you push no and no receipt. Sometimes you push yes and you just go, Okay, do I need to go <laughs> inside to get this receipt? No, it's not that important. Okay, you forget the machine. But, but whether it's machines or it's people or whatever, it, I'm big on shared agreements. I love communication. I love full communication. I love shared agreements. If people could, even in relationships, go through day by day, just looking at shared agreements, uh -huh. you know, a lot of times people get, are married for 30 years and they've they for even forgot what they agreed upon. It's all it's all stepped down, yeah. but there's no sense of of that that it's a day by day, moment by moment mm -hmm. shared agreement. Even to stay together in a relationship is yeah. takes an agreement. Yeah, yeah. So I like that context of things, and so for me, um, the situation which you're describing is, you know, I know the larger context. I know all the. The calls, the counseling, the effort, and everything goes in. I know also that these people are not coming like to, with filling out, you know, long devotional stay applications and saying, I want to be part of the community and this and this and this. It's, it was much lighter. It was like to come and explore yeah. Mexico and, and one of the two is kind of interested in open to healing and a little bit and just feel their way and everything like this. So for me, when, when our, the energy of, of the communications, which can be so deep and wonderful and rich, if it, if it starts to spin off into something, mm -hmm. a lot of fear and doubt and specifics and, and hypotheticals, you know, very commonly in this world things can spin into all kinds of what if, what if, what if mm -hmm. hypotheticals. That's not the best use of my time and that's not mm -hmm. really the best use of Ooh. anybody's time in the community. Then, then okay, let's, can we have a shared agreement? kind of a come to Mexico and explore things and so forth. Yeah. And that's when you come up with the shared agreement. I also am big on integrity. So it's like, you know, it's not, we're not encouraging people to break their word. We're not encouraging people to, you know, to mm -hmm. become distracted or, you know, to be out of integrity. We would love to extend that in all ways and, and that's where shared agreements come in. Even when we've had people who come together in a relationship, you know, in the community and they, they join together and they really explore it, do you feel it, pray on it, then they're coming together and then that's a, a day by day, it's a moment by moment shared agreement and then if it comes to the point where, uh, you know, there's something that I need to look at for healing or it comes to a point where it's like this, this feels very heavy, this is not for me or whatever, then it's like, okay, let's, let's look at the shared agreements. So there's a context for it. Just like if you were counseling somebody and you counseled them for two years and, and as a therapist you kept notes and then somebody started saying, I don't even know if I've made any progress and I'm not sure about this and I have my doubts, you could pull up onto your screen mm -hmm. the notes. I mean, I even know a physician who he loves to document and take notes on everything. And 
he's so funny. It's almost like uh, he's so much into it. He so much loves to document anything that it's almost like coming over, okay, incision. And he goes, <laughs> put it in this computer. I mean, he, he, loves, he loves to do that. And it's also when he has to come back to anything, boom, 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 he just pulls it up on his screen and he's got the whole context. So there's no, nothing that's kind of a wiggle room or gray uh -huh. areas, you know. And I, if somebody has that much care that they love documenting that much, then, you know, and do it uh, from their own enthusiasm, mm -hmm. then I think that's, that's fantastic. You know, he's not going to have a lot of gray areas. He'll just boom, 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 call it right up on his computer. So I'm just big on those things. I like communication. I like shared agreements, and, and knowing that those shared agreements, when we keep them... You're happy. You're happy. Yeah, everybody. A everybody's happy, and it builds trust. Yeah. So when it builds trust, then you're yeah. more willing to follow the Spirit, you're, you're more open to what's, what's next and what's given, and you're on the adventure of trust, development of trust, that takes you all the way back to Heaven. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the context. Of everything. Yeah, it's a good, it's a beautiful context, mm -hmm. actually. But you have to be so open to something underneath all the words, like, mm -hmm. uh, and that I find just takes so much trust. Like, what are they really saying? Because sometimes they don't even know. You know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, you, over 10 or 15 years, I won't share everything with you, and you'll just come in and share something with me. And at first, if I could get I could get defensive, but you don't even know what's in my mind on a, like a personal level at all. But the Spirit knows exactly, and you're, you're speaking to something much deeper if I want to pay attention and listen. And then I remember all those other thoughts that I was hiding mm -hmm. that was actually, oh wow, you know, maybe not consciously hiding, but whatever, hiding. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh wow, and then that actually builds trust when, yeah. if you're willing to go in that direction. You know? yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Healing is a great opportunity to, to go so deeply inside that you come to a place of peace and contentment. Because what that contentment and peace is, is, is true empathy. And no one, you know, has been uh, privy to this depth of, of true empathy. I mean, Jesus Christ was the ultimate in true empathy. You know, you may have heavy burdens, and, but lay them on me. Come to me, you know. It's like, ah, I'm afraid of dying, I'm afraid of epilepsy, I'm afraid of starving. Bring them to me, lay them all on me, and I shall give you rest. That's a lot of confidence, you know. <laughs> oh, Lord, Lord, the sisters come. If you'd only come earlier, our brother, you know, could have saved our brother, and now he's dead and he's buried, he's in the... He's in the <laughs> no problem. <laughs> he's in the tomb. Uh, and they expect him to say, yeah, it's too bad, I, I was detained, and so on and so forth. He, he says, uh, no, this one is not to the death. Imagine like your sisters and you're telling Jesus about how terrible it is that he couldn't, if he'd only been there earlier, their brother wouldn't have died, Lazarus, and, and, and he's already buried now and everything. And, and Jesus just remarks, this one is not to the death. You know. What is that even? And that's a confident, true, he's in true empathy. Mm -hmm. This one is not to the death. Then he goes over there, and he's been dead for days, and he's, and they move the stone away to get, and, and then he just walks up there with all the confidence. <laughs> Lazarus, come <laughs> forth. That's pretty confident too, to say that <laughs> when you got a, a stinky body, that's in a, in a cave, and it's decayed, and it's, uh, you know, it's been wrapped up in the, the clothes. And, and then, to the shock of everybody, Lazarus with these, these stinky grave clothes comes out. That, that's like, mm hmm that's what I'm talking about. It's not to the death and come forth. And everybody's like, well, their whole perception of the whole world, and their whole, whole I know mind of what's possible and what's not, not possible just got inverted <laughs> as he walks out of that, you know, tomb. And, 
And everybody, you know, that happened a lot with Jesus when people would arise, take up your bed and walk. That's not supposed to happen. When you're paralyzed, you're paralyzed for life. You're not supposed to hop off a couch and go walking off. Another, the, the daughter, the, the girl that was dead, you know, and goes wow. there, bring, again, she rises up. Her father is astonished. Wow. He was so sad, he was grieving what was set in stone that his daughter had died and Jesus mm -hmm. comes there and shows that there's no order of difficulty mm. in miracles. So for all of us, we get a lot of opportunities mm. to practice true empathy. Mm. If, if, if I'm mm. clear and content in my mind, mm -hmm. then, then it's fun to come together with people because they'll be claiming there's problems where there are none or mm -hmm. claiming they're afraid of things but there is nothing to be afraid of, or mm. claiming there's been evil, dastardly things done when in fact there has not. Mm. And then that is that presence mm. that, that heals. And so it will come through in a way mm. that can be heard, but it will also come through where it starts to put things back into, oh, remember our shared agreements, mm. you know, imagine how you could navigate mm. difficult times in a relationship if you just came back to, oh, remember when we came together, when we sh said this, and we mm -hmm. agreed on this and agreed on that? Oh yeah, that's right. That's a context. Mm -hmm. And are you now saying you, you don't agree to that? You know, are, are you now, and what reasons are you giving? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, with the the house, there could be a perception of there's mold in the house, it's unlivable, and then since we bought the house, we've been living in the house, and JP's been in there, and I mean, all these different people have lived there, you know, without a problem. And even with Andrew coming, it was like, oh, okay, that's a bonus. You know, anything to, to improve the house or whatever, <laughs> so we're, we're in for improvements, but, but it's it's very interesting always when you come together where, where someone says, this is a problem, and then the presence of love, you know, comes through in a way to say, well, it's actually not a problem. You know, that's the ultimate purpose of a miracle worker is to, to realize that, you know, through this love, this very generous, very generous love, th there's not a problem. Jesus was would use a lot of extreme examples. That's why he was the way shower, because people were always coming to him claiming there's something wrong. And he was, through his presence, was saying, no, actually, it isn't. Okay, you might have, this might be an example, you might have to do it with me, because so right now, what's coming into my mind is we left the house for three or four months, and it was never there before, it just appeared no one has seen it, and so it's this new thing that they're witnessing. But I'm, pr I feel I'm presenting a problem. That th that's what I was buying into. And you usually tell me something wise. <laughs> 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 but it, that's the kind of thinking that I, that just isn't ending. Like it's, and I, be I believe it. You know, I say, oh no, no, that's a new problem, not mm. an old. Well, it's very similar to like when we went to Mexico, we were pretty clueless about everything. I mean, that's why I, even when our community was going down there, I was telling everybody, think of it as Jupiter, moving to Jupiter. They'd say, why Jupiter? And I'd say, have you ever been to Jupiter? And they said, no. And they said, well, that's why I'm saying Jupiter. Like, just go down there for the healing of your mind and don't, as best you can, have expectations. Don't think you already know how it works. Because when people come and move to Mexico from other countries, you know, it's the mind. They, you, they bring their expectations with them. So how does the, how does the government work? How does the police work? How do how does utilities work? work? How does mold work? How do all these things, you know, if you're coming there with an open mind to really be shown the miracles and really be carried along, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, then you, hit, you come with that mindset. And I think very much that was the way for us when we went down there. In other words, you know, we walked into things and, uh, you know, 
pipes. Uh, you probably know there at the temple one time, uh, one morning we woke up and there was toilet paper in the yard. And we were looking down and going, oh, look at that. Were we teepeed or something? Some <laughs> right, 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 right. Oh, right. I don't like those forgiveness people. I would throw, you know, like they do in high school, throw toilet paper over the, there's toilet paper. And then it's like, huh, the strangest thing. What's that? And then we don't know. And we, we get Jose over and he's like, oh, you know, there's, must be this, your septic's clogged. And, you know, this house hasn't been fully lived in for five, we don't know what we're doing. We're just taking it every day and we're using it for the backdrops and the joining. But we didn't know why there was toilet paper there. We had all these encounters and then days later, um, Jose's got a team of like seven or eight guys and they're the whole digging up, they're down there digging this very deep ditch, almost like they were digging a grave, mm -hmm. it was so deep, going down to find the, the septic and and to do everything, just trusting and went into it all and well, eventually it all played out, but we, you know, we didn't really know, we didn't, we were using it for the holy encounters and we weren't, we weren't demanding anything, we were just showing up and exploring and trusting that things would work out. And so that was one example of, it, of many, mm -hmm. many, many examples that we, you know, they it was decided to have put a safe in the house and then when we got the safe, it got in there, they they locked the the combination the keys or something of the safe, uh, not memorized or whatever, inside <laughs> the safe. And so I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then that was weeks of things. It took weeks before it, it cleared itself out. You know, that that's the thing about about everything, but we just have found in Mexico it's just accelerated that it's it's really undoing the I know mind. Yeah. And is it the same lesson for everyone? Yes, it is. There's not some privileged ones that that don't have to face those lessons. It's mm -hmm. it's the same lesson for everyone, no matter what country they come from, no matter how they got there. It's the wow. same lesson. There's lessons in patience and letting go of time. There's all those kind of things. So, you know, it's not a sense of like, hmm, that, that us, like with home ownership or whatever, there's, there's the I know mind of trying to figure things out. And then there's a whole different purpose that's underneath there, that's yeah. what things are really for. Yeah. And as long as you're identified and holding on to defining problems in the world, yeah. then you, you don't get the lesson of forgiveness. And you don't even get, which is the only lesson that, that you're here for. That's all of time is for, is for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have any other purpose. Do you see everybody as having that purpose, even if they were to voice back to you? I, I'm not into that. Yeah, I mean, it's forgiveness. I had that happen one time when I went to uh, South America, to this little town, and uh, there was this local school and a, you know, a, a girl in the school had been raped and uh, I went into a little restaurant to uh, be introduced by this um, female kind of clergy priest. She was going to do a five minute introduction on the course, or five or ten minutes, and then introduce me. But she, everybody was, it was like an angry mob. There were, these were teachers from the school and she was going to start talking about forgiveness and everything, and they got angrier and angrier for those five or ten minutes. I was just in the back sipping a tea, <laughs> waiting to get introduced. So by the time, uh, she only got through maybe half of her time, um, she just went, ah! She threw her arms in the air. She said, I cannot answer your questions, because they were like, what do you mean forgiveness of woman? The girl has been raped, and they were just an angry mob of of teachers, mostly female teachers, very angry. They were, they were hot, really angry. She, after so many minutes, she just, I, I cannot answer, I cannot answer what you're saying, your questions. But there is one here who can. <laughs> and she throws her arm up there, and I've never seen that female bishop get off that stage as fast as she could. There he is, right there. And I'm just with my <laughs> cup of tea. I thought I could 
10 minutes, but it's like, okay, so I get up there and, and I remember. So there was a whole group that were not interested, really. <laughs> On the surface, they were not interested in hearing about forgiveness. They just got more furious the more she talked about it. I get up there and <laughs> you went up. I just went up there and I looked at all, I, I looked them in the eyes, just, they were quite angry, just smiled, I looked at them in the eye, and then one of them had actually read the beginning of the Course. And she was like, I have heard this book says that, that this Course is a required Course. Why is that so? You know, she was upset about the required word, even in the introduction. And, and I said, well, I said, it's not the book that's required, but the book's all about forgiveness. And forgiveness is required. No one goes back to heaven without oh, forgiveness. Yeah. That's the gateway. Everyone must go through. It doesn't matter what religion, whether you believe in God or not. I just went on. I said, this is the gateway. We must forgive. And, and just with all my heart and all my joy, I just mm. said, yeah, this, this is the way it is. And then they, there was a look at me, and I was like, she's, hmm, Clara, Clara. Just that was, okay, you made it through the first question. <laughs> and then they just launched on me with every single thing around their perception of what was happening in the town then and everything. And I patiently addressed every, the spirit came through with mm -hmm. such gentleness, but such directness with every single one. Hmm, okay, claro, claro. Then the next one, and then they just sent one question after the next. And then, after about, I don't know, an hour and a half, um, they got happier and happier and more loved, lovingly connected to me. And then at the end, they were like, helados, you know, ice cream, <laughs> helados party, come to my house and come David, come. Turned into a big party. That that most people, even when they're angry, they aren't as far away from the happiness as they think, but they need mm. open connection. They, like not glossing over anything, not justifying yeah, anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. not trying to dance around anything, but yeah. a real, real heart-to-heart mm -hmm. -heart connection. And they actually all lit up, and, and like, that just happens mm -hmm. over and over again. And then I see them at other gatherings and go back to Argentina, see them again, you know, it goes on. It can be an instant of that care and that connection that kind of ignites mm -hmm. them and, and sends them in the right direction. Yeah. And then we have no idea how that, that changes everything. It's so beautiful. I, I'm just, because I'm thinking of just like how the other day when, because I've been pulled out of things and it's been like this, like what? Okay, that part's sort of easy, the pulling out, but then how do I, who do I communicate with, how, what's the... And there's like moments where I'm locking up, and then if I don't join, right at that moment, it just spins into something else. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this talks with the animals. We just walked it back to, oh, no, no, you can call me, we can connect. And I'm like, then my heart's just like, okay, that's what I wanted, somebody to connect with. Mm -hmm. So like yeah. when you talk about these women, then they just get that connection point. Yeah. And we feel that everything else just dissolves. Yeah, it's like yeah, everything dissolves in that, because that's what's really called for underneath. That's yeah. what everybody is calling for the same thing. And generally, you know, even with us, with our community, you know, we we talk things through and work. We use everything within the community for healing of the mind. It's a very direct and focused purpose, but. As you know, over the years, we've, we've worked with contractors, plumbers, bricklayers, SEO people, I mean, you know, film and people. film people, and, and on and on. Uh, Francis just got <laughs> her uh, receipt that the, the film has been received oh, yeah. in Cannes, and so Lisa sent me the official, oh, the Cannes Film Festival, it, it's been accepted. Now, by mid-April, uh, we'll know if it's if it's been submitted, whether it's accepted. But we work with many, many people in the world, and we, we do work with integrity. And then the more we work with them and get to know them, whether they're plumbers, electricians, contractors, roofers, whatever, it's, it's like a relationship. You know, you work with them, and, and it's for the joy. It's mm. for present joy, actually. That's the, mm. that's the purpose. 
and then the specifics just get used for that. So, so we've had to have times where we have a, a friend or a contractor or something where we, we do need to sit down and we need to have a meeting and, mm. and talk. It's common for us. Mm. You know, we're not like cloistered group that are just kind of living off like a cloistered group of nuns or, or uh, monks. You know, we, we have many, many interactions. We do sign contracts with AT&T for our phones or Verizon. We sign contracts, you know, yeah. many different contracts. Yeah. And I remember when I was, you know, guided by Jesus working with SEO and then he's like, okay, here's, here's who you're going to be working with. I'm like, in Dubai? Jeez, on, that's on the other side of the world and that and then Pakistan. It's like, this is what I... I for SEO, but it's, yep, so it's like, okay, these are the given ones, these, it's like that God un, unfriended me thing. Yeah, yeah. Here's your two friend requests, Victoria in Dubai and, and Ali in Pakistan. Okay, and in and, and the whole thing, many things with currency differences and all cultural differences and everything, but just working together, you know, in a common collaboration mm -hmm. and, and agreeing, again, shared agreements, shared agreements, talking about those. Things start to slide, talk about it. You know, I did a lot of that, but that's no different than we've done for many, many years. So you come together and, and still there's a sense of, of let's come to agreement, let's have integrity with this. Mm -hmm. If we agree to something and somebody feels something's out of whack, then let's look at that, let's talk about it. But, you know, it's, it's, there's a welcome to that, there, that's part of it. And even with relationships, it has to be that way where, you know, you stay open. There was that woman that I, I was working with in, in uh, at Art Devotional in Spain, you know, and she talked about how her, her marriage had become so stagnant and dysfunctional and, and such a sense of disconnect and all kinds of things with it. And, and then I was talking about zooming more into the moment and then it reminded her of the time before she had even got married, how much joy there was that, that her and her partner had had every week meeting for coffee and, and maybe some dinner to see if they would renew <laughs> their connection for another week. Mm -hmm. It just took it week by week. And she was like, how come I was so happy when I was doing it week by week and how suffocating <laughs> and how, how detached and, and how bored everything dysfunctional, everything came with this marriage package, whatever, till death do we part. Mm -hmm. and, and I think any time we try to hang it on to time, we try to look for time for safety, you know, like an insurance policy or or even a lifetime vow, or all these kind of things, whenever we, we try to hang our safety and security onto time, we've hung, we've hung our hanger up on the timeline, mm. not, still not seeing that that's, we have to choose it. Mm. This moment, intuitively, we have to choose it with our mind. We can't, we can't look to all these false senses of security that are really ego definitions and ego projections that don't really bring any joy, they don't bring any intimacy, they don't even bring happiness, safety, security, it's just a bill of goods. Here, here's, here's a time bill of goods, do you want it? <laughs> if you subscribe to it, then you will have to unsubscribe mm -hmm. at some point. You will have to cut the cords to those ego beliefs. Mm -hmm. That's what healing is, that's what we're doing. There's always opportunities to, to have uh, mm. true integrity, mm. to, to you know, have come from true empathy instead of getting into people pleasing and false empathy. So it can seem like it's a backdrop with SEO or with doing jobs or collaborations or whatever, even all the collaborations we do in community, that's just the backdrop for true integrity. Mm. So. Once you see that, wow. then it starts to put everything in a new context because then you're not going to pressure yourself and stress yourself over 
the details, you're going to let the Spirit speak what needs to be spoken, yeah. but from that place of true integrity. Yeah. And that's always the lesson. Yeah. That's beautiful, just to remember it. It's about, because even that situation with Andrew, it's the integrity is not really about you said you get the job done, you get it done, because technically, yeah, it's, it's did you communicate? That was, that's an integrity, a deeper integrity mm -hmm. of communicate. And then it goes even deeper to integrity of mind, you know, mm -hmm. it's like there's these layers of, yeah. well, we use, I said I'd do this, and I did it. Oh, good job. Well, now we still got to keep going, yeah. like some kind of layers. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we have seemingly multiple assignments, because it's seemingly dropping down deeper and mm -hmm. deeper into that integrity of really identity of, yeah. of who I really am. That's, oh, that's wow. what the biggest one is. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's really beautiful the way that it works. We have a lot of opportunities. Well, maybe I can, yeah, maybe we could end this episode at, with that. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. <laughs> oh, I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> yeah, thank you for this. This is oh, really beautiful. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah it's lovely. Beautiful. <laughs>